afternoon, this is Bob and uh, this is the Highway Podcast. Uh, fun with all the eclectic nonsense that I tend to pander around on this uh, channel. And today I've got somebody who, well, we go back quite a long way uh, through Muay Thai, our mutual lover Muay Thai. It's the uh, author, recent, recently wrote his book, um, which I'll put in the description box below, of Suck It Up and Go Home. A fascinating read, but we're going to talk about that more later. Because first, Simon, I just want to introduce you and say hi. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I'm very good. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the intro. Suck it up or go home. Or go home. Go home. Or go home. Uh, <laughs> you got you got a choice in the matter. Well, yeah, or go. Home. <laughs> or go home. Did you, did you suck it up and go home? No, I you didn't. You stayed there. <laughs> yeah, I, su I sucked it up for eleven months in Japan. And right, then at the end right. of the end of that period, after a couple of months extra in Tokyo, yeah. I did I did come home. But um, so yeah, people are I, going to be intrigued because you mentioned Japan and Tokyo. Yes. Uh, but I introduced you as a Thai boxer. Whoa! <laughs> so uh, keep listening because we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about the book a little bit later. But I, I want to go back to you know as they always do with these things to so go back to the beginning of okay. you know those same old questions. What set you off on the journey? of martial arts yeah okay what okay. what, what start what kick started that time yeah I'm, I'm probably very similar to many other people who got into martial arts uh, at, at school you get into you get into fights get into scraps as we used to call them um i was a fairly unruly boy i guess and right. I, ended, oh. I ended up getting sent to boarding school oh. uh and yeah and back then boarding school was quite a tough place i think it's mm. not quite the same in fact i've been back to my old school a few years ago and it's very very different indeed but back then it was a pretty tough environment and there was a lot of bullying went on and i got bullied um i wasn't particularly strong didn't know how to look after myself i'd done judo very very early on i'd always pestered my mum and dad to let me do karate they didn't want me to hit people so uh, they put me into judo but i found that when i got into um a confrontation you know the, the natural response from a kid would be to punch me in the face and I couldn't get close to, to use any of my judo. So I, I kind of suffered at school. Mm. There's one guy in my school uh, called Adrian who I talk about in the book. And um, yeah. he was a, a Kung Fu. I think he was a Kung Fu black belt. I don't know who he trained with, but I, I know that everybody in the school was terrified of him, even the prefects. And he was a year older than me. So we got the respect of everybody. And um, there's a couple of incidents that I had in his company where he demonstrated some stuff and I thought, you know what, when I leave this school, I'm going to go and I'm going to learn martial arts. So I left that school at 16, went yeah. back home, uh, and started at a Kung Fu school, Laogar Kung Fu. Um, so did that for a couple of years. Um, but I found that the way I practiced that martial art was very traditional. Uh -huh. And then when I did competitions, we, we, we'd fight in a completely different way. So we'd, you know, we'd use the horse stance in, in the traditional type yeah. stuff. Then we turned sideways for the competitions. It was semi-contact. It usually felt like full contact. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do very well at that. Um, so that was kind of my baptism into, into, into martial arts. Just coming but, back to the low guard. Yeah. 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 Low guard um, made a real impact on the competition scene. I remember. It was, back, it was massive. Back period. Incredible. Yeah, it, was, it was massive. Uh, because they were basically fighting other people. Because Lao Gar is a fairly modern style of Kung Fu. Mm, mm. It's based on some of the old ideas, obviously. But it yeah. was a very new modern thing. And yes. I remember when it started developing in, in the Midlands. It's where it really started. And um, I, I remember them hitting the circuit. The, you know, the semi-contact and the non-contact circuit. And they were just wiping people out. Yeah. You yeah. know, established traditional systems of Kung Fu. And, yes. and karate as it, as it was. Yeah, I mean, some of those guys, I, I did quite a few tournaments back in the day, semi-contact uh -huh. tournaments. Some of those guys, so fast. You know, they kicked me in the head three times before I'd even get one shot off. Yeah. So I, I didn't do particularly well, but where I used to train in Stafford, next door to the, the, um, the Laogar Kung Fu school, it was in a recreation center. Oh, right, Next yeah. door, as I was leaving, there were guys coming up the stairs in shorts, Thai boxing guys, going into this tiny little room. And I'd, I'd, I'd hear them as I left start their warm up and their practice. And I'd hear this banging, hitting pads. I'd hear all the noises you associate with a Thai boxing school. <laughs> and, yeah, <laughs> and all the grunting and all that stuff. Yeah. And I thought, wow, Thai boxing. And I, I used to get Martial Arts Illustrated and Combat Magazine. Oh, yeah. And, 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 you know, Thai boxing was the thing you did if you wanted to do full contact. Yeah. So one day I plucked up the courage and went into that class. And uh, I was welcomed in by the instructor. I won't mention any names. Um, went in, 
um, got the gloves on, hit some pads. And at the end of the class, I think it was an only an hour's class, I was invited to spar, mm. given the fact this was my first yeah. ever Thai boxing class. And I ended up sparring with a guy who had a fight coming up in the next two or three weeks. And basically, I was stood in this small room. The guy squared up, uh, squared up opposite me, threw a, left, threw a left jab, right cross, hit me, both, hit me in the head with both shots. I bounced back. My head hit the wall, knocked myself out. And that was my introduction to Muay Thai. Uh, and I, got, I basically got left in that room. My friend was with me. He got one of the Kung Fu guys to come out and see to me. I went to, I went to hospital. I had a concussion. Mm. And then I realized that I had a decision to make because I tried Thai boxing, but I hadn't really tried Thai boxing Muay Thai as it should be taught. Yeah. So I could either quit and go back to Kung Fu, knowing that the Kung Fu that I'd learned didn't help me in that situation, or I should seek out somebody that could teach me Muay Thai properly. Mm. And that's when I referred back to uh, Combat Magazine, Martial Arts Illustrated. And I'd read about this guy in Manchester because it was all happening in the Northwest. Yeah, of course then. it was, yeah. You know, it was Master Skin, uh, Master Toddy, various other people up there. Um, but the, the, guy that, the guy that really interested me was Crew Tony Moore. Yeah. And what interested me about him was that he, was, he, he wasn't Thai, but he was going off to Thailand on a regular basis he was learning from the ties. He was, he was taking fighters over there and his fighters were having success. And I thought, I just had this feeling, you know, maybe it's fate. I don't know. Yeah. I thought this is the guy that I need to learn Thai boxing from. So I plucked up the courage. I, I vividly remember this. It's back in the day where we didn't have mobile phones. You know, I didn't want my mum and dad to know what I was doing. No, they didn't want me to do it, especially <laughs> no. after I got knocked out. So I was 19. I got the big long wire from the phone yeah. in, the, in the hall into the yeah. kitchen. <laughs> and I rang up Tony and um, I was, I was terrified. I was terrified. Um, <laughs> you I rang him up. Him? Did you, you all right? How's it going? You yeah. Right? I, I knew it. I knew it have a Mancunian accent, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I did, I did, un, I did understand him because I was, I was an hour and a half way down in Stafford. So. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Anyway, I remember, I vividly remember saying to him, I've, I've read about you in the magazines. I'd like to come up to Manchester and I'd like to, I'd like you to teach me how to, to kick because Thai boxers have got the strongest kicks. And he said to me, well, you either want to learn Muay Thai or you don't. So I can't, he basically implied, I'm not going to teach you how to kick. No. To learn the system. And I hadn't necessarily appreciated there was a system to yeah. it because you just saw fighters in the ring. Um, so I, I went up to Piccadilly, picked me up at the station, took me to the uh, fighters and fitness center in Clayton, had my first class. And I, I my eyes were opened. My eyes were open. I, I probably trained three or four years in, in, in martial now three years in martial arts. And, you know, I got no power. I kicked, he invited me to kick the bag. I got no power, punched the pads. They didn't even move. Um, and I realized that this was the guy to teach me. So I, I trained then on, on a regular basis um, every week, every two weeks, traveled up to Manchester on the train, got picked up at Piccadilly and trained with crew Tony, which was, you know. And of course he's, he's very much a traditionalist, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the discipline was incredible. Yeah. Um, and I maybe didn't appreciate the importance of discipline back then. My time in Japan has definitely taught me about discipline. Yeah. But, um, you know, he was very strict. I remember I didn't train in many of his classes because um, I tended to do it privately. Yeah. But, um, you know, I have been in one of his classes. I remember that a guy turned up a couple of minutes late and he sent, he sent the guy home um, because he was late. And that, that's, you know, I think that's as it should be. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think you're right. I mean, that it's what I was saying. You know, I, I was brought up with uh, traditional karate originally, mm. and exactly the same thing happened in the dojo. People yeah. would turn up, everybody was respon responsible for cleaning the floor yes. before yes. we even start, and the gear yeah. had to be pristine. And Tony carries that same ethos across to Muay Thai, yes. which I think I think is, is an important element that's missed yes. in, in a lot of classes that I've seen Muay Thai. Yeah, I think I think over the years, you know, back back in back in the nineties, back in the late eighties, yeah. nineties, that was the golden era. Of yeah, Muay of course Thai. it was. Yeah, you know, all the fighters were coming up. Um, there were some really good camps. There was there was lots of competition between these camps, and people were, were traditional. You do the Ramoy, you do the Y crew at the start Absolutely, of the fight. Yeah. And I think nowadays it's 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 drifted, and, and and people are teaching Muay Thai. They're not necessarily teaching the traditions. They're, they're teaching more of a, a kind of kickboxing MMA yeah. type style. Uh, and Muay Thai is, 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 is different. Muay, Muay Thai comes from Krabi Krabong, Muay Baran. Yeah. You know, it was honed on the battlefield. This is just yeah. the unarmed version 
of, of the, the Thai national art, if yeah. you like. Yeah. So it's, it's been sanitized, I think, over the years. But back then was an amazing time. Well, I mean, I mean, I had a, you know, just to echo that sentiment, I had a guy come in the gym, this was pre-COVID, so I think it was probably March, somewhere like February, March, he came in and he said, uh, he, he actually said, oh, I've done a bit of Thai boxing before. Uh, you don't do that, uh, that stupid dance thing, do you? <laughs> Did you show him the door? Oh, yeah. I said, <laughs> yeah, the stupid dance thing is around Moi and the white yeah. crew, which is part and parcel of what we do. He said, oh, well, I don't want to be learning that. I just want to learn to be able to fight. I said, yeah. well... There's a gym just in Redditch. He's really good. Uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I'm turning business away because mm. you're right. It's been sanitized. The, the Ramway yeah. is not given any credence. The traditions are not observed. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've still got a shrine in the gym, you know, yes. I mean, yeah. it's just part and parcel of it. It's part of the art and, and uh, the, the students who get it, get it there. Yes. And that's what they want. They want to be able to fight, but they also want to have the other aspects to it. You know, the, the more ritualistic elements of it. Yeah. The, the it's, it's spiritual the whole system. elements of it. Yeah, it's the whole system. There's a right and a wrong way to do stuff. Yeah. And, and Tony it, embodies that, doesn't he? Oh, I mean, it, it a, seems amazing. Like if you cut him in half, he'd have Muay Thai written. <laughs> yeah, he, you know, Crew Tony or Arjun Tony now. Arjun he, Tony, yeah, yeah. He, he, he lives and breathes Muay Thai. He's, he's probably, I guess... I, I trained with him probably for 15 years, yeah. fairly consistently. It drifted a little bit at the, at the back end. Um, I think he's probably moved a bit more into into Krabby Krabong now. Yeah, he has, um, yeah. Which, you know, I think I think was definitely his interest. And in fact, I think I, I talk about it in the book. As I was starting Muay Thai with him, he was starting Krabby Krabong. So, nice, so both on. on a... Yeah. Yeah, both on a separate um, a separate journey, albeit a similar journey. Yeah. So yeah. he he was a massive influence. We're still in touch today. I've not not seen him for quite a long time. I probably need to put that right at some point. Yeah. Um, he's reading my book, so hopefully he likes what I put about him. Um, and he introduced me because I li I lived in um, I was born in Stafford. Yeah. Then I moved to Nottingham to univer go to university. Yeah. So he introduced me to Master Lek. Who'd, uh, I <laughs> think, a character. yeah, I think he'd recently, I think he'd recently come to the UK from Thailand. Yeah. Um, and it was quite unusual as you'll, as you'll know, Bob, back in the day, if you train in one camp, you don't go and train in another camp. No. So I was a, a sits I am camp and I started fighting by now. So I was a sits I am camp fighter and suddenly I was training at Sinekon Chai in, in Nottingham. So when I used to, when I used to fight in competitions, I, I never quite knew who I was representing, but, but it, it, it didn't really matter because, you know, Tony and, and Master Let had such a good relationship. They're good friends, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I was always very grateful for, 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 for Tony allowing that relationship to happen mm -hmm. because what he did do and what, what I think he's always done, he always puts his students first. Yeah. Um, and I've certainly seen that over the years. And he put me first and what's best for my student to develop his technique. Okay, I'll still train in Manchester, but closer to home, I can then be in an environment where I can spar with people. I can train more regularly. Uh, a master leg opened my eyes to uh, the, the foundations I got from the foundations I got from from Tony were invaluable, yeah. because when I was thrown into a class with Master Leg, Master Leg had a very different teaching style. Yeah. So so he what used to happen sometimes he'd he'd demonstrate a technique, and everyone every, everyone in the in the in the class would look around going. How do I do that? What, what just happened? And they come and ask me because they knew I got a background where I understood the footwork. I understood, I understood the technical elements of it so I could help break it down because yeah. the traditional tie way was, well, watch what I do and copy what I do. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, I think Crutoni recognized that in the, in, in the West, our way of learning is we like to know you put your foot here, you turn your hip over when you throw yeah. that kind of stuff. So I kind of helped some of the other students get to grips with, with the, um, the techniques and uh, was with Master Leg probably for another 10 years. So I think I, I think I did about 25 years in Muay Thai altogether. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Leck came over to my gym once uh, to do a seminar. and I, I think I was, I think I was there. Yeah, you were possibly. there. Possibly, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got yeah. photographs of it somewhere. You have to and dig I remember, you remember he set up that elaborate shrine? Yes. Yeah, the massive shrine and everything, and we talked about it, and I thought, this is great. You know, it's what I've been talking about. And yeah. now I've got somebody who's from Thailand coming and they're just reflecting what I've already been teaching these guys. And yes. everybody loved that session. Like you yeah. say, uh, uh, you know, he's not the best teacher for Westerners, but my guys had already been well grounded in fundamentals, I think, yes. most of them anyway. And they had a great experience. And it was like, when are they going to bring him back? You know, that big Thai guy who was, keeps laughing. 
That's what they, because <laughs> yeah. he very, was a big fella, nice wasn't guy. he? He was a tall, yeah. for a tie, very tall. Very big for a tie, but very oh. lovely, lovely man. Oh. Um, but he, he never, in Nottingham, he's been in Nottingham for a long, he's back in Thailand now, but was in yeah. Nottingham for a long time, but sadly never had a full-time premises no and, uh, hugely respected by all the you know the time oh. masters up in the northwest yeah um but loved muay thai never had a school and kind of people came and they, they kind of went and some of the discipline that was very evident at sits i am which i i love and i think is massively important yeah it it, it, it didn't quite translate mm -hmm. to how we trained at Sinacon chai which yeah was it was it was a more relaxed environment sort of looser sort of structure yeah yeah and 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 we'd be training in you know when i used to go to sits i am to the fighters fighters and fitness center and then um the gym moved to ashton under line i trained there oh. for a bit um you go to a you go to a place that you were familiar with you know when you went in you'd bow to the shrine mm -hmm. um you you knew that was your environment yeah when you train muay thai in a a leisure center <laughs> or, a, or a gym and and, you, and suddenly you find a gym that you like and it's you know we, we train at a great place in nottingham it's castle gym it's it sh not castle gym uh, i can't remember what it was called but it was near the castle uh, castle marina near castle right. marina it was a big a big gym big ring and it was it was fantastic uh, and then we, we 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 had to move from there and then we're in a different gym and you're constantly wandering yeah it's very hard yeah it's to it, maintain it, well, you students. have to have a stable environment don't you in order yeah. to to get things yeah. yeah which is why i've always had my own gym you yes. know i've had my share of church halls and halls at the university and things like that mm -hmm. uh, but i realized early on uh, you need to have that yeah. place and it, it it people walk in and the association is oh yeah this is where we do muay thai there's yeah. the ring there's the shrine there's the monk on there's the robes you know there's there's the first aid kit <laughs> <laughs> yeah you need that sometimes <laughs> um you know, it's and it it has that atmosphere, doesn't it? Because it's yeah. become it's become uh, steeped in yes. Muay Thai. Because that's you, all we do there. And you you get you get a more you get a more committed student because oh totally yeah. Pe yeah people you know I used to I used to travel to Manchester once a week you know it take me it take me door to door two hours two and a half hours to get there and back and and then you you have some people that kind of moan to go oh. ten minutes down the road yeah. and and if you're moving around, even within a city, it's amazing how people drop off because, oh, yeah. oh, we're there now, the parking's not so good, I can't quite get there on time. So we'd have this constant churn of, of, of students. And, and what makes a good Muay Thai school, apart from the instructor, apart from the environment, is a good collection of people that are all coming up together and pushing each other and challenging yeah. each other. Uh, and we had some of that, and there was some, some hardcore um, students that we would master let for a long, long time, including myself. But below that, there was a churn. A yeah, you have churn. people drifting in and out. Uh, yeah. and I, I think yeah. that's true of any gym. I mean, you know, the, uh, one of my guys who uh, had a club down in, in Wales, and he, he's passed it on to somebody else now, Lee Stingmore. Mm -hmm. uh, Lee was a great instructor. Um, uh, he trained with me for years. He used to come up to Birmingham to train with me. And then I qualified him and he set up his own little place down and it had a really successful called Celtic pride. And it's a, it's got a lot of good fighters down in Wales. And, um, he, he, he was on Facebook one day and somebody said, yeah, is, is, is your club any good? You know, blah, blah, blah. He said, Oh, you've got to understand one thing. It's not a club. It's a camp. And the other yeah. thing, it's not about it being good. It's a family anyway. Yes. It's a family. Yeah. And it's got all the idiosyncrasies of a family, all of the dysfunctional elements <laughs> of a family. Said, yeah. We're one big family. So don't think you're just joining a club and you're paying your fees. You're joining yes. a, a family. And that's, that's the ethos I guess I've always had. Because yeah. whenever I train in Thailand or train with, you know, alongside Tony Myers or with Tony Moore or, or, or Toddy, um, it was always, it was always a, a level of respect uh, mm -hmm. and discipline and everybody you know, conform to that because that was part of it. Um, but there was always that element of we're all we're part of a group. We're all yeah, on the same yeah. team sort of thing, you know? Yeah, and I, it's like, I, I totally yeah, agree I with you on about Muay Thai being a solitary sport. And, I, and we were saying, well, it's not, is it? Because we all work to help that fighter yeah. win his fight. The cornermen are there to help him win yeah. his fight. You yeah. know, the coach is there to help him win his fight. So, yes, yes it might seem like a solitary sport, but it, if you think you're training on your own, you're not. Yes. We're yeah. all here to back you up. You know, it's I, th that. I, th I think you hit on an important point there that 
I, I'd, I'd like to explore a minute and just explain mm, what, no, I, what no. I think about it. Because you said that you don't just pay your money and train. And that's, that's, what, that's the difference between martial arts and a gym membership. Yeah. I yeah. think because, yeah. because martial, the martial arts I've trained, I've trained quite a few, as you, as you know, mm. Muay Thai, Aikido, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, Krav Maga. Yeah. You have a, you have a different relationship with a martial arts school and your martial arts instructor than you do than when you go to the gym or you go and play football or you yeah. go and play tennis or whatever else, because there's that, there's that spiritual element, I believe. Mm. And there's that respect, reciprocal respect. Um, and in Japan, you know, the, the, the sensei student relationship, it's, it's the same in any martial art. Yeah. You know, the crew student relationship in, in Muay Thai. Uh, yeah. It's the same in any martial art. And, and going back to what we said earlier, some of that is slipping, mm. I think, because people now are training a bit here, training a bit there, training a bit somewhere else. Mm. And they're losing that longer term relationship with their with a teacher yeah. um, who is there as more than just a teacher. They're a mentor. They're a, a father figure or whatever else. So, yeah. I what, what, what I've also noticed as well, Simon, you brought up that point about, you know, how the martial arts have changed now really in a gym membership is just mm. a gym membership and it's yeah. not being part of a group. Um, I think with the rise of the mixed martial arts, and this is not like a dig at any specific groups or anything, because, mm. you know, I know guys who fight in MMA and UFC who train bloody hard mm -hmm. uh, and they're athletes in their own right. But I've, I've, in recent years, I've been getting quite a few young lads in the gym who've got quite an attitude on them. Yeah, uh, and 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 the, what the UFC's done, the bad part of it, I feel, is it's it's turned it in almost like a WWE type of thing. Oh, look, Rawr, at me, yeah. look at me! Yeah, you know, I battered the guy. I'm going to kill you, and all of this mm -hmm. sort of thing. And I, I've 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 chucked one or two people out of the club because of it. I've actually yes. taken them on one side. So look, this attitude doesn't work in here. Yeah, you're, you're not going to try and kill your opponent at the weekend. You're going to fight somebody who's working just as hard as you to fight. So yes. you're not fighting. And that, that was for an interclub, you know, and I was like, you know, if you're taking that attitude to an interclub, we're all here to have a good time. Your yeah. opponent has put as much work in as you have. Enjoy it. Yeah. And at the end of it, you'll just have, you'll have made a new friend. Yeah. So if you don't leave this ego by the door, you're not coming in, you know? Yeah. I and think, it, um, I shit. think if you, you know, you train, you train in Thailand, I've trained in Thailand. You, you can be in a, in a camp in Thailand. And, and you can be rubbing shoulders with the champion, you know, oh, oh, Lumpini, Lumpini champion or, or <laughs> yeah, yeah. Roger Damnern champion. Yeah. Who's he? Oh, Samad Payakaroon. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and, and they're the nicest, humblest oh, people. Absolutely. And, and, the, and yeah. there's, you know, there is, of course, in any sport, there is some ego, but there's, yeah. there's, there's probably less. And I think when people watch MMA and I think MMA is very good, very yeah. good because it has evolved martial arts. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, but when young lads who are, getting influenced by watching certain people in that sport <laughs> and how they behave and they try and emulate that. Yeah. That's not, that's not what it should be. No, because there are some egos. There are some, yeah, egos. Are. There are some great, know, great yeah. people, but there are some egos. Yeah. And I know some of it's gamesmanship and yeah. psychology. It's part yeah. of the show, isn't it? It's part yeah. of the show, but obviously young guys don't get that yet. They're not at yeah. that level. Yes. They don't understand it's gamesmanship in some cases well they've got um, to sell tickets they've got to sell tickets to the show and i think you know the, the ufc is the is the main is the main body um of mixed martial arts now mm -hmm. you know when it was coming up it's got to sell tickets on that basis because it's a new sport yeah. in, in thailand you don't necessarily need that because it's the national sport and, and a bit like football here people are going to go they're going to they're going to support yeah it's um, part of their culture isn't it yeah exactly people will exactly. go even though they don't train they'll go yes. and see the fights yeah yeah exactly so you you just to go back to the time you're training with tony and you're training yes. with leg master leg yes. um you obviously had quite a few fights in that period of time i mean yes. you do talk about this in the book yeah, but yeah. for those that are listening okay yeah, yeah. Uh, I would, uh, and I would say to those that are listening, go and buy the book because it goes in even more detail. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> That's you. the first plug. <laughs> um, um, how many fights did you have? Um, that's a good question. Nine fights in total. Yeah, and you yeah. were a British champion. No. Oh, you no. didn't get a British champion. I did didn't you get win a title? Champion. I won uh, Northwest Light that's Middleweight. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. won. It was either Midlands, I think it's West Midlands or Midlands. I think it was Midlands like middleweight title. Right. Well, I, I kind of run them back to back. Yeah, back I genuinely back. thought you'd had more than nine fights, right? Because 
I don't know why, maybe it was that whenever I was judging or at a show, you were always there. <laughs> <laughs> so you the always seemed to be there. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I had this idea that you'd had 25, 30 fight. And, mm. and I'm going to blow smoke up your ass now. I thought when I first saw you fighting, I thought, wow, what a good technical fighter. Mm. Because, and I think, but that's down to Tony, isn't it? Tony Miller. Oh, absolutely. Without, 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 without Crew Tony, I would have yeah, been I, I, nowhere. And this so. is why... I think I thought you had a lot more fight. Yes. And, and this is what we try to get through to the students, isn't it? That, you know, the fundamentals are vital. And yes. if you follow some of the old ways, that's the way you get better, you know? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ba Camus, basics, basics. Camus made one of my students walk for a week in front of a mirror. <laughs> a week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Until yeah. he got it right. And then he moved him on to punching and kicking. But yeah, I not mean, so, so somebody walks into a Muay Thai gym, the first thing you want to do, they want to punch the bag or, or kick the yeah. pants. Yeah. You know, I remember going up to Manchester and before, <laughs> before I do, before I do anything, mm. um, you know, Tony would have me bouncing on a tractor tire, left uh -huh. foot, oh, right yeah. foot, left yeah. foot, punching, shadow boxing, skipping, yeah. all of the, all of the basic stuff that, that, that when I went to Thailand, it was the same experience, mm. um, which, which taught me footwork, taught me good foundations, good basics. I, I never, I never wanted to fight though, Bob, to be honest. I never oh, had a, right. okay. when I started with Tony, I never wanted to fight. But shortly after I, I started with him, I went to Thailand uh, and I went more as a tourist, but I did a couple of days training um, at Carry Boy Gym. Carry Boy, yeah, which uh, is one Carryboy. of Tony's favorites, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And back, back in the day, you know, there was no, there was no well, Western. No, well. Carry Boy is a bit rough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to find the place was, was a challenge in itself. Yeah. And I had, to take, um, I had to take a photo of Tony and I. And that was my passport, passport <laughs> yeah, to get in. Yeah. Otherwise, I, I couldn't train. You wouldn't have got there, yeah. No, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have got in. So, no. That experience and then going to watch the fights at Lumpini, Lumpini in particular, I came back and I, I, I said to Critoni, I said, look, I want to fight now. I, I, if I'm going to understand Muay Thai, yeah. I, I get the culture, I get the spirit thing now, I want to fight. And that's when it started. And that's where it all started. Yeah, but I, I, I guess I have a regret. You know, I, I kind of, I fought in free, I didn't fight that, although I was at all the shows for some reason, I, I didn't fight as frequently and I didn't have this, I didn't have this real burning desire to be a, a world champion or no. I, I kind of just did it to get some experience. I do have a bit of regret that I never went for British, British champion, mm. um, but I didn't fight regularly enough. And, and then I was, I was, by then I was at university. Okay. So I got all the other distractions at university. Yeah, of course, yeah. you, 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 can't, you can't regret, you, you make decisions at a point in time of in course, your life. Yeah. Um, but I would have liked to have got a bit further probably. Yeah. But, but I mean, it, it sort of got you on the, at least you were working with the right people. Mm. You know, you, you could have been somebody who, you know, ended up with a, like the first school you, you encountered, yes, you know, yeah. with, you know, just what sounded to me like when I, when I read it in the book, I thought, oh my God, I want, that's terrible. You know, but you Shocking, hear of yeah. it so often now, Yeah, yeah. you know, um, where the, the instructor is obviously less skilled than he should be. Yes. and um, doesn't understand what he's got, you know, doesn't understand what he's doing and actually how dangerous this thing is. But as, as, you, as you know, Bob, I got my revenge, didn't I? Oh, you did, yeah, but... <laughs> by accident, but by I By accident. <laughs> so we'll come, we'll come to that now if you want. <laughs> okay, okay. You want, you want me to tell, tell the story? Yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, so, so I'd, I'd, had a couple of, I'd had a couple of fights. I think this was my third yeah. fight. Yeah. And... Um, I went up to Sheffield. It was at one of the football clubs in Sheffield. I forget which one. And uh, you know what it's like when you turn up for a fight. All the fighters turn up. They're parading yeah. around the, the changing room. Or the, yeah. um, always, used to, always used to be in these like ballrooms with carpet. It, and, yeah, with you know, and that, that usually has got beer all over the it. The end carpets. Yeah, yeah. Ne never, never the best environment. Smell of cigarette smoke. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Hanging in the air. Yeah. In fact, back then, I think people did used to yeah, smoke around the ring. Smoke. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, I'm walking around the, 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 the kind of weigh-in area, the doctor's area, and I see the instructor mm. who taught the class when I got knocked out. Yeah, and I correct. see his, probably his number one student who was a lot taller than me, mm. um, more experienced than me because he started before I started. And then you wait to get matched and I'm fighting this guy, Paul. And I'm, like, I'm like, oh no. And, and, <laughs> and, and you get this little voice in your head that says you're going to lose. It's the same thing's going to happen again, da, 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 da. But with Tony there, you know, he, he, he doesn't pander to those thoughts. Nope. He gives you the confidence to go in there and do the job. And, um, yeah, 
that that fight, although I didn't knock the guy out over three rounds, it was a C class fight. Yeah. I punished him. And the best bit about it was that his in, he tried to quit in the fight and his instructor displayed how he pro, how he displayed no care to me, basically. Yeah. Dragged him into the corner at the end. What are you doing? And and, and all of this stuff. And it was kind of um it wasn't about getting victory over Paul, who I fought. No. But it was about getting victory over the demons of that day when that, I got knocked out, my first out, baptism yeah. into Muay Thai. Yeah. And also kind of showing the instructor in the other corner that actually if you teach your students properly, mm. this is what they're capable of. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was down to the excellent instruction I got at Sitsayam. Course, in, in a very short corner, period of time. as you say, he doesn't. Yeah, in a very neg- short period of time. Negativity or any of that sort of thing, because yeah, I mean, you know, Tony in his own right was a great fighter, you know. Um, yeah, you know, absolutely, and, absolutely. And, and an old school, old style coach, yes. of which there are very few, I'm afraid now. Yeah, very yeah. Few. Unfortunately, We're all dying out now. <laughs> a, di- a dying breed. Uh, you know, if you look at Tony's school, you know, world famous sits I am camp, you know, but hardly anybody knows who Tony is. Yeah. You talk to yeah. modern Thai boxers and they haven't even heard of him. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. he's not out there blowing his own trumpet all the time. No, no. But if you walk no. into his his school and if you were if you were lucky enough, and I regard myself very lucky to have found him and to yeah. have trained there for so long, if you if you trained at that school, what you got from that school and, and seen a contract with Master Leg yeah. was, was something that I think it's very difficult to find now. I think you're right. Uh, I, I, I see it very rarely. Yeah, and it's quite uh, it sort of saddens me a bit because you know uh, I've invested most of my life in this sport and yeah. you just see people abusing it and I don't say anything I, I you know unless somebody says something to me um, I sort of just keep my mouth shut and yeah I'm the old fella in the corner just leave me alone <laughs> <laughs> the best way safest way with his, with his dodgy hips and his broken knees you know <laughs> yeah. uh, have you suffered physically um I mean, I know that you said, and I quote, because it was an interesting quote, you went to have your man, your, your well-man check. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the well-man check, the doctor said, you have to stop or you will kill yourself. And that was in your 40s, wasn't it? So that's not so long yeah, ago. Yeah, that was two years last ago. Last year. Last year. Uh, last year two or the year before. The year before. Year yeah, before. because you'll know yourself, Bob. But martial arts gives you a mentality. Yeah. And, it, and it's that, that mentality of, of don't quit push forward um you know there's a there's a there's a japanese proverb that i actually i wear on my oh you wear on yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Sushi, is it? which is it says since you say it's in japanese it says since you say and it says nana korobi yaoki which means four down seven times stand up eight yeah. so it's all about not quitting and and taking knocks and coming back so you know i'm 48 now mm. and i would still yeah all oh, right yeah, okay 48. yeah so I, I was up until about three years ago and although I only had nine fights, I've had so many gym wars. And, and <laughs> in, 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 in Master Lex school, when we, when we sparred, yeah. we sparred. Yeah. We, sparred, we sparred hard. So I've, I've had a lot, of, a lot of gym wars over the years. And, and I, was, I was getting to like 45, 46 and thinking, these young guys coming up, I'm a little bit slower than I was. Mm. Do I want to keep getting hit in the head? Mm. Uh, which is an inevitable part of, of full contact sparring. Yeah. Um, my knees were suffering from, uh, from Japan in particular, yep. my left knee in particular. Um, and these were all starting to take their toll. I didn't go for the well man check because of that. It's because no. over 45, you probably yeah, should you just have a quick check up. Yeah. But, but, but the doctor at the well man check, he says to me, um, I think he asked me about whether I'd had a holiday and I said, Oh yeah, yeah. I go on holiday. I said, I, I like to go to, um, I like to go to one of the, um, Canary islands. This yeah, is before you said in your book, Grand Canaria. Yeah. yeah. Grand Canaria. And I said, what I normally do is, um, you know, I'll, I'll spend some time by the pool during the day. And then in the afternoon, what I'll do is I'll go for an hour and a half run, uh, in the, in the blazing heat. I won't take any water. I always take a, I always take a little bit of money just in case I, I, I collapse and I need to yeah. get a taxi home. Yeah. Um, and, I, I would just, I would just run in the blazing heat. Yeah. And, and I said, I'll be exhausted at night. And he said, if you keep doing that at your age, you are going to kill yourself. Mm. And, and that was a, that was a, a, a moment where I thought I'm not 21 anymore. Yeah. I need to probably slow down a little bit. Oh. It helped with my decision to say, actually Muay Thai, you've been great to me, but 
I'm just going to do a bit myself at home, train myself, train my kids, but I'm not going to spar anymore. Yeah. Um, I'm going to focus on one martial art. I'm not going to go on the crazy runs when I go abroad. I'm going to enjoy my holidays instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead yeah. of going. And, and I do a gym session as well, aside yeah. from the runs. So it was all getting a bit crazy. And that's because my mentality, particularly from Japan, was in a place where push, 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 push. Hardship, hardship, hardship. Yeah. Which could have hurt me in the long run. Well, I mean, I can I can talk from personal experience on that account because when I was uh, my son's, um, he had his uh, stag do at the top of Ben Nevis. Oh wow! Uh, and I was in my fifties. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. We ran up Ben Nevis. Wow! And I shouldn't have done it because my knees were bad anyway. But my son was like, he, even my son said, "You don't have to do this." And it's that same mentality. It's like, yeah, no, I will. I will yeah. do this. Yeah. Ran up Ben Nevis. And mm. what really killed me was actually running down. Yes. And ever since then, my knees have never been the same. And my partner was like, that, that is what finished you off. I think I was 50, 55. And, and I, cause you think you're still 19, don't you? You, know? you do, you do, but your body, uh, your body slows down and you, yeah. you need uh, to do different things. And the wear and tear is enormous, you know, particularly Muay Thai. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, my, and running, running, and Muay Thai, running on hard surfaces is just horrendous, yeah. you know. But martial we do arts, it, is, we do we, it. We do, we do. The, the the great thing about martial arts, it gives you tremendous mental strength. Yeah. The downside with martial arts, and I don't know whether there is a martial art that bypasses all of this, but no. in my experience, and I've trained quite a lot of them. You, you are going to get injuries, mm -hmm. and you are going to you are going to hurt your body in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. Um. So it's it's a delicate balance, isn't it? Of course, you it want is. to keep you want to keep going, mm. and you feel you should keep going, and you don't want to you don't want to slow down. Mm. But that well man check, I forgot I put that in the book actually. Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, it made me laugh because I thought <laughs> I know exactly. I've heard <laughs> this from I've heard it from medics that I work with. Yeah. What, what do you mean? You you what? You're running over the Bretton Beacons with a group of lads. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're fifty. You're fifty eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, he's a bit sore. <laughs> um, uh, Master, Master, Master Lek was, um, you know, bless him. He, even, even, even when I was like 40, 44, 45, if we ever, if we ever got somebody new to the gym, mm. we'd ever, or the camp, I should say camp actually, what well, we used to train in the gym. Um, if we ever got somebody new who came, who'd done some Muay Thai before, and if they ever had a bit of an attitude on yeah. them, <laughs> what he'd what he'd always say is there was there was myself and 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 one other lad Kaleem who was who was who came up with me and we used to fight fight together. Yeah, he'd always he'd always just call us out by name, and we'd be in the ring and it'd be full it'd be full on gym war. Yeah, um, and that that had to stop. It couldn't happen anymore. Well, I I still use some of Lex's bizarre press up exercises that he. <laughs> you remember yeah. those? Yeah, the stick I do. sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I still use them to this day. <laughs> and I always acknowledge Lek. I'll yeah. say, okay, guys, right, get in a square. You rest your feet on his shoulders. You and they're all going, what, what, what? And then when oh. they do it, they're like, oh my god. And tie tie army apparently. Oh, I loved it. Army. And the the great thing about that exercise was it gets people to work together as a team, mm. which is an important thing. And it's and it kills you. Yeah. I mean, it kills you. You know. Yeah. So I remember Lek stuff fondly. You know, when you said you'd gone back to town, I was like, no, you know, yeah, part of me left. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I it's did a, like the guy. I mean, I, obviously, I wasn't as close to him as you were, uh, but on the few occasions I'd meet him at the BTBC or when he came over to do seminars for me, I just got on with him. You know, he's yeah. just, just an approachable guy. Yeah, very um, much so. Very I, I, much I talked so. to him about Buddhism and that, you know, because he'd been a monk, I believe, uh, for a certain period of time. Yeah, I think I think so. I think yeah. um, I think in Thailand you have a decision to make at an early age. Yeah. I think you either do military, you become a monk, or, or you become a monk for yeah. it's either three days, three weeks, three months, or three years. Yeah. You know, you, he did you tell me the story decision. one time. Yeah. So we, yeah. we, you know, he used to he used to bring the amulets back from Thailand. I've got right, so many yeah. amulets and 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 whatnot. Um, but a, a really a really nice a really nice guy. It's a shame now. You know, in, in Nottingham, there are some, you know, Muay Thai camps, but, yeah. you know, Master Let leaving has left a really big hole. Of course. Um, oh, I can only imagine. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's like your Thai boxing career. That is. And then, dusted. And then in, in, <laughs> what made this, made you have this decision in 2006, wasn't it? To go to Japan. Yes. Yes. I'm right. See, I have read some of this book. You have read some of it. 2006. And you spent 
well, the course is 11 months, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So ba I, basically what happened, I went to Japan in 2005 and in 2000, yeah. it's probably 2002, 2003, um, one, of my, one of my friends, I was working for an accountancy firm in Nottingham. Okay. One of my mates came around on a, a, for a drinking night out. He'd started training in Aikido at this um, school in Nottingham. Right. And uh, we're, we're, we're in, my, in my apartment. He, 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 said, he said, grab me or do something. And he, and he basically did this move. Hmm. Um, and it, it kind of knocked me off my feet and took my hmm. balance. And I'm like, wow, what's that? <laughs> he said, it's Aikido. And I said, oh, I know a little bit about Aikido. I know, um, I know about Steven Seagal. I've watched all his films. You know, he kind of polarizes. You either like him or you don't. But <laughs> yeah, he, yeah. Back in the day, not so, not so much recently, he made some great films and that was an influence. So um, I was looking at the time for, for, for something else to do because I, I wanted to, the thing with Muay Thai, if you get into a street situation, the, the natural instinct is to, is to punch and kick, knee or elbow. And I was, I was curious about what other things you might be able to do if somebody grabbed you or, you know, I never did security work or anything like that. But if I, if I'd done a, if I'd been on the door, I couldn't necessarily punch somebody in the head, knock them out, da -de da -de da So I decided to go to this Aikido club and I got quite interested in it. I got my black belt in, uh, in Nottingham, mm -hmm. uh, the Shooter Camp Black Belt Academy. Uh, interestingly, the, my friend who introduced me to it, he, he stopped training and I carried on. Yeah. But at the time there was, um, there was a book called Angry White Pajamas. Yeah, I remember that, that book, Twigger. Yeah, Robert Twigger that was doing uh, yeah, rounds. Yeah. So everyone was reading it at the yeah. Shooter Camp. And I read this book. And, and this is kind of my personality. I read the book and thought, wow, I didn't know about this 11 month course with the Tokyo riot police in Aikido, but now I do know, I know it's going to burn a hole in the back of my brain <laughs> until I actually go and do it. And I, I started to ask myself the question, well, could I do it? What if I did it? Do I have the time to do it? And I made the decision that having got my black belt in the UK, I would go to Japan was en route to Australia. I was planning to settle in Australia, but that's a, another story altogether. Oh, right. Um, and stopped in Japan and went to the Hombu Dojo, the head dojo in Tokyo, did some of the basic classes, got some information about this Senchise course and decided I'd, I'd enroll on it. So in 2006, 1st of April, 2006, I started 11 months of grueling training, five days a week, um, four sessions a day. So it was four hours a day training. Mm. um indoctrinated to the dojo learning japanese culture amazing experience tough experience but an amazing experience and it gave me a different thing that i i, I got a background in muay thai and i got discipline from muay thai but this this took the, the whole discipline and and mental capability thing to a whole new level so um the Aikido introduced it as sort of Japanese concepts, I yes. guess. The Japanese concepts of uh, the martial way, Budo, uh, yes. Bushido. Um, and you literally give everything up, didn't you? Yeah. Go there. Yeah. Go. Yeah. So, so I had, um, you know, I had a career in recruitment, yeah. I had a house, got a car, got a nice life, earning decent money. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I just, I just decided that I was going to work and I thought, you know, I'm 34. I kind of had a, my first midlife crisis. I probably had my second towards the end of the book when I came back from Japan, you, yeah. you'll have read about. Yeah. But um, I thought, well, why not? Why not? I know that opportunity is there. I could sell my house. I could sell my car. I could get on a plane. I could go to Japan. I could teach English for a living. Why not? So one day I decided I would, and then I put the plans in place to, uh, to do it. And that's what I did. Did you... Uh yeah, ask you a funny question here. Did you at all waver? Did you ever, when you got out there, did you ever think, oh, what have I done? No, no, I didn't. Okay. No, because I don't know whether you've ever been to Japan. Yeah, Yokohama, but Yokohama. a long, long time ago. Yeah. It's a bit like, I guess it was, it, was, it was kind of similar to the first time I went to Thailand. It's such a different experience. It's such yeah. a different culture. Oh, completely. Uh, all, 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 the, all the kind of fear and anxiety about being in a, in a new country and what you're going to do next and how you're going to survive and how you're going to live and all of this stuff, because you're dazzled by the, the new environment that you're in, you kind of forget about that. And I guess I had, um, I was fortunate. I didn't realize it at the time, but when I went to boarding school at a young age, mm -hmm. I was, I was kind of forcibly removed from my, my, my family home and, and made to live somewhere else. So yeah, I yeah. kind of got used to 
being in a different environment and in quite a tough environment. So the, the decision I had to make in Japan was whether I trained in the IPAN, the general classes, mm-hmm. or whether I trained in the Senshuse classes. Yeah. And every morning I train in the IPAN classes and we train on half of the mat and the Senshuse. And Senshuse means specialist. It basically means somebody who is the lowest form of life in the dojo has committed themselves to the dojo for this, this crazy course. And I'd watch the Senshu say, I'd hear the shouting, the screaming. Um, it had more of the feeling of when you first walk into a Muay Thai gym, yeah. banging the pads. And, and I thought, I'm on the wrong end of the mat here. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, if, 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 if I'm in Japan to do Aikido, I want the hardship. And that, when, I talk to, when I talk to my wife about you know, craving hardship, she doesn't necessarily get it. Most people don't understand no. that. No. You see, most people would be at this end of the mat going, thank God I'm at this end yeah. of the mat. Yeah. And not that. I'll watch that end of the dojo, but yes. I'm not going to go down there. But yeah. you, you know, being odd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, very odd. Yeah. <laughs> have decided, I need that. I need that. That's got to, but that, you, you mentioned going back to us a little bit there. You mentioned boarding school. It yeah. sort of created an independent spirit, didn't it? I think it did. Because, you know, because you had to fend for yourself. Yeah, I mean, at, thir- at thirteen, I went to boarding school. I was I was a naughty boy. I was terrible. Yeah, you said parents. yeah. <laughs> and and I remember having the tour of the, the the boarding school with the headmaster. All the pupils are really nice and friendly. The headmaster promised the earth. Yeah, you can do this. You can do that. And I remember the first day when they, my parents had dropped me off. We got taken yeah. into the house, into the boarding room, and basically that was it. The yeah. the, the life they presented completely different to the completely life I was different. about to live. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I've never been to prison, thankfully, but it's, it's as close as I can probably imagine without going to prison. You can, you can. Isn't get. that something you would like to do? No. <laughs> no. Come on, if, it's if, a challenge. Simon, if, it's a challenge. <laughs> no. in, in, in fact, I was watching um, the TV series Cold Feet. I think it was the last series. All right. Yeah. And uh, one of the, I can't, I can't remember the character's name. He, get, he gets sent to prison. And uh, he's, in, he's in prison and his, I think his wife comes to visit him and, and she goes, how are you coping? And he goes, well, it's not too bad, really. I, after all, I went to boarding school. And I, I, I said to her, <laughs> you got that. exactly, yeah. exactly. Because it's regimented. Yeah. You have to do what yeah. you're told. Yeah. You do everything to a certain time. Yeah. And, and you're, you're kind of housed up with some, well, some people you don't want to be housed up with. Let's yeah. just say that. Because I've been in the army. Yeah. You know, um, it, 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 essentially, it's a bit like being in the military mm. where you're, you've got a bunch of disparate people with different mm. ideas about things. And you've got a bunch of thugs who are shouting at you constantly yeah, and exactly. you get bullied and you'll be getting bullied by, you know, whoever happens to be senior to you. I mean, I went so, to a secondary Sounds like the Century say course that does. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, so <laughs> I guess it was like coming home for you. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I never, I never really had a problem with the, um, the hardship. I, I, I wanted to see how much I could take. What I was curious about at the age of 34 Mm. I got I got a comfortable life, got a good job, and all that other stuff that I've spoken about. I wanted to see if I, having red angry white pajamas, mm. if I went to Japan, could the Japanese break me on the Senshi yeah. course, or could I, or could I do it? Mm. And I, I knew I could do it, and I was determined to do it, and I did do it. Mm. Um, and and when you go through an experience like that, when you're talking about hardship, when you go through hardship, you come out at the end of it a very different person. And if you learn anything along the way, you come out of it as a, as a better person, I think. So, yeah. so whilst you were in Japan, in order mm. to make a little bit of money, you were working for the, was it the Berlitz? School? Berlitz, yeah. Yeah, uh, the language yeah. school. Yeah. So, so did, I, you, did you learn Japanese? Did you pick up? Uh, skosh, skoshidake, which means a little bit only. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> there you go. That's about the extent of it. <laughs> oh, you, you burst my bubble. I thought you'd come on here going, oh, thank you, konnichiwa, you know, whatever. Konnichiwa, konnichiwa. I, I can understand more than I can speak. But yeah. I, I, like when I went to, first went to Thailand, I learned some Thai so I could mm. communicate and it's respectful yeah. to do that. So I had, I had Japanese lessons and the, the teachers, we had, um, we had three classes every day. The first class was run by an international instructor who generally spoke English, but then it was Japanese instructors. So ah. you had, you had to understand some Japanese. Yeah. Yeah. And on my course, every, every year is different. Mm. And mine was the 16th international course. And on my course, they brought in this thing called Zagaku, which was basically a meditation class every week mm-hmm. where you had to sit in that very uncomfortable kneeling position. Seiza. Oh yeah. Good um, old Seiza. Yeah. Nice. And you had to, uh, which is probably ruin my knees. 
and you had to after two or three weeks of being able to recount um a hansei and shukan which is a uh, a, a reflection as to what you could improve on and a habit that you're proud of. Um, we were told we had to do it in Japanese. So uh, I was, I was pretty happy that I knew some Japanese and yeah. I could write the alphabet and this, that and the other. So I, I think it made my time in Japan more interesting and more enjoyable knowing at least some of the language. Um, Cause it, it definitely, it definitely did help. And then I was well, teaching, teaching at Berlitz English. Yeah. And I guess most of the instructions would have been, well, all of the instructions in training would have been in Japanese. I guess. Pretty, pretty, pretty much. Yeah. Particularly you know, the second I, and third classes. Yeah. I know when I did karate back in the sixties and seventies, mm. uh, all of the Japanese expected you to know everything in Japanese. Yeah. There was no forward stance. It was enko to dachi, you know, yeah. there was like, you know, uh, everything, all the commands, you know, yes, hajime, yeah. you know, all of hajime. them, you know, they're still <laughs> yame. They're all, they're, they're like, for, yeah. yeah, they're trapped inside my head. So yes. I can speak karate Japanese yes, very well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I had to do because I remember Anoida on a course, Sensei Anoida, who was fearsome and he was known as the tiger in Shotokan karate. He was one of the first people to come over to, to the UK in the early 60s, if not the late 50s. And he actually slapped people on a course if you didn't get it right. You yeah. don't understand? You don't understand? <laughs> And this poor mate of mine, he was standing there, and I think he was in, uh, I think it was in like some sort of shikodachi, some sort of horse stance, with his hand out like this, and he's, and he's, his fist wasn't in the correct position; it was too low, and he and he told him to adjust it, and he didn't do it because he didn't didn't understand a word. He said, "You don't understand." And Derek, my pal, goes, uh, "Who's sensei? Oh, sensei! Oh, sensei!" Slapping him in the face like that. I was like. Yeah. I'm standing there like shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we were like 16, you know. Yeah, it'd be terrifying. Like, uh, oh, oh, we were absolutely terrified, and in awe of their ability as well. Yes. You know their level of discipline, self-discipline, as well as as uh, their their own training ethic, because they yes. could do it as well. You know, yeah, they weren't yeah. like some fat slob standing in front of you do this sidekick. They were like boom, yeah. and you just led by example. Shit. Yeah. You know, this is good. A, a, a Japanese dojo. When I first walked into the Yoshinkan Hombu Dojo, mm. the, the feeling of tension <laughs> and fear was was thick. And we were we were told very very early on in the course that whenever we were in the dojo, we should be in a state of fear. You, you could never relax, yeah. and, and and you couldn't. Someone was always on you, and, yeah. and the instructors there, you know, they could dish out the the, the goods as well. Because so you, you spent 223 days training, didn't you? Yes, I counted yeah. them every single one, yeah. And you remember yeah. every single one. And what I'd like to do at this point, because we've done about an hour now, Simon. Oh, wait, okay. I love to finish it. It's a really good way to end it. You know, you're, you're about to start this training and all you can smell is the smell of fear as you That's enter it. the dojo. That's it. Yeah, it's a really nice way to end things. <laughs> and we pick up on the next one where we talk, let's talk about, you know, what was going on in this dojo that was so different, you know, the personalities, the people okay. that you encountered. And of course, I guess some people would call a brutality that was being yes. meted out. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's um, just on that to give people a flavor as to, as to what's come. Uh -huh. Obviously I, I wrote this book based on mm. a diary that I kept. When I what was book Japan. is that Simon? <laughs> oh, so, suck it up or go home. Suck it up you... or go home. <laughs> That's it. So, so I wrote this, I wrote this book based on this diary and I, I wrote this story during lockdown mm -hmm. and I put this story out into the world and I, I have no idea what feedback I was going to get. Mm. And the, the feedback that I've had it's generally been good, but the feedback that I've had in abundance from some of the top Japanese, sen uh, not Jap top sensei, not Jap international sensei in yeah, the world yeah. is wow what a level of hardship in that, in that year, you know, that, that, that your year was not necessarily the normal year. You had quite a lot of hardship and, and quite some difficult characters to deal with. But for me, it was just normal. Yeah. That's yeah. all I knew. So it's yeah. been very interesting, but we'll talk all about that. Yeah. We can talk about that next. So Simon, I'd like to thank you so much for giving up your time today, Matt. Thank you. Uh, the book, and I'm going to get the title right. Okay. Suck it up or go home. I don't know where I got and go home. So Suck it up or go home by Simon Gray. It's available on Amazon, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going is. to put all the details and the links in the description box below. Thank so you. go and buy it 
and help this poor man out. He suffered. <laughs> let's get it. Let's get him some new knees. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Simon, yes. thanks a lot, mate. Thank thanks you, very much. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.